All right, I'll open us in a word of prayer. Lord, what a privilege it is to be together as your people gathered under your word. Uh, what a privilege it is to know you, to be known by you. Lord, it is an unspeakable privilege to be loved by the holy, just, infinite God of the universe, maker of all things, the only true God, and especially to be loved when we contemplate our own sin, when we think about your holiness contrasted with our finitude, uh, but also our moral turpitude. Uh, we have been born in sin, we sin out of our nature, uh, we have grieved you, we have rebelled against you out of our, the very core of our being, and yet you in your infinite love have made a way that sinners could be reconciled to you. And so we praise your grace, we praise your love, we praise your mercy, and we praise you for your holiness and your justice which provided a solution to our sin which upheld your reputation. And for that, we give you praise that we might join in your holiness and perfection one day and in progress even today. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, over the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at Salvation 101, uh, kind of an introduction to the doctrine of soteriology. Soteriology is one of those college words you need to learn so you can say it and impress your friends. Uh, it comes from two Greek words, soterios and logos. It means something like a word about salvation or the study of salvation, right? We, we say biology is the study of bios or life. So soteriology is the study of salvation. And that's what we're going to look at over the next several weeks. And we're going to begin this morning by asking the fundamental question that must be asked before we can hope to address other questions in soteriology, we must ask the starting question, from what must we be saved? What are we to be saved from? Uh, sometimes salvation or being saved or, hey, when did you get saved, become Christian lingo. And we don't know exactly what it was that we got saved from how we got saved, whom we got saved by, or what we are saved unto. Those are critical questions we must ask and answer. And they begin with the fundamental question, what is it that I need to be saved from? And if you uh, imagine yourself sort of in the middle of a potentially tragic canoeing accident, maybe you don't know the accident is happening. If you got your canoe into class three rapids and somehow got it sideways and we're headed right for a rock, you may or may not be aware that your disaster is imminent. You might just be merrily, merrily, merrily floating down the stream. But you need to be aware that that rock is going to get a hold of the middle of your aluminum canoe and the canoe will be bent around the rock by the rushing river. You will be tossed from the canoe in your life vest, pinned under a rock and tumbled until you drown and your life vest will show up in the ocean. I wish that that were merely a hypothetical situation. When I was a kid, uh, we went on a rafting trip in Alaska. I was in elementary school. And as we were rafting down this river, the Eagle River, uh, right near our home, uh, we we're in a, a large raft with, with nine people and in front of us and on the shore were people hollering with their arms up in the air saying, look, look, where are they, where are they? And just a few boat lengths in front of us, uh, an older couple had wrapped their canoe around a rock and they found the man's life vest in the ocean. We need to know what it is to be saved. We need to know the dire circumstances that we are in. And when we use the Christian lingo about being saved, when we talk about salvation, it's critical that we understand what it is that we need to be saved from. There is danger from which we need to be rescued. And if we get the diagnosis of our problem wrong, we cannot hope to get the right solution. If a medical doctor were to analyze your situation, 
when you had some form of treatable but dangerous cancer and said, oh, it looks like you have a cold. Take two of these and call me in the morning. A delay in a diagnosis or a misdiagnosis could prove fatal. I would contend that the world has missed the diagnosis of the human problem fundamentally. And the results of that misdiagnosis are eternally fatal. So what we're going to do this morning is just look at a list of things from Scripture that we are to be saved from. And we'll start just by recognizing we need to be saved from sin. We need to be saved from sin itself. And we could go to a lot of places to look at this. I just want you to open your Bible to the book of Acts. And after Jesus came, died on the cross, rose from the dead, after the church was established in Acts chapter 2, the followers of Jesus began to proclaim the good news of salvation. And I want you to just listen to some of their words as they described what it is we are to be saved from, specifically to be saved from sin. Look first at Acts 3.19. Peter is preaching to a crowd, and he says in Acts 3.19, Repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away. So that your sins might be wiped away. And down in verse 26, For you first, God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. Humans need to be saved from sin. Acts 5.31, we have a similar statement. He is the one whom God exalted, speaking of Jesus. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. In Acts 10.43, we read these words. Of him all the prophets bear witness that through Jesus' name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. Acts 13.38. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him, through Jesus, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And Acts 26, 18, the Apostle Paul is speaking before King Agrippa. And he says, I'm in the wrong chapter, Acts 26, verse 18. That God had sent Paul to the Jewish people And to the Gentiles, verse 18, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in Christ. What is it that sinners need to be rescued from? We need to be rescued from sin. This is totally out of vogue in our culture today. What does the world full of sinners do about their sin? They whitewash sin. Sin is always something somebody else does, or sin is removed totally as a category. Uh, We make mistakes. We're all human. We excuse ourselves. We blame others. And fundamentally, humanity has to make the attempt to eradicate the, the categories of sin from our conscience altogether. And if we can do that, then no solution is needed. No redemption is needed. No forgiveness is needed. Listen to Isaiah chapter 59. Here the prophet makes known, particularly of Israel, but this is true of all of humanity, the fundamental problem. Behold, Yahweh's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor is his ear so dull that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. And what's tragic is while the removal of sin from the conscience is the pattern of the world, the evangelical church has been squeezed into that mold as well. It's very common for professing Christians today 
to totally eradicate the idea of sin from their so-called good news. And I would tell you there is no good news without the bad news. You don't get the diagnosis right, you have no need for a solution. And you can't possibly get the solution right. Just this week, I drove past a home in Gilbert, and there were Christian lingo signs in the front yard. It looked like uh, a political campaign. It's just those little two metal stakes with the vinyl sign in the front. And, and there were Bible verses and John 3.16 and things that say you are loved and God loves you. And, and there was another sign in the yard that said simply this, you are good and God loves you. What a tragedy. That is not the Christian message. E even though this home was plastered with Christian lingo and quasi-Christian messages, this sign that said you are good and God loves you is fundamentally adverse to the Bible's message that sinners are loved by God. Good people don't need to be rescued, but sinners do. I saw a bumper sticker the other day that said, you are good, dash, God. You are good in quotes. And the so-called author of the quote, God. <laughs> well, that is not what God said. He said, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who does good. And so these, these ideas that the, 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 the dirty conversation about sin must be removed from pleasant and, and, and gentlemanly and Christian-like conversations. Uh, that tendency is actually the death of the gospel. It is the death of the Christian message and leads ultimately to the eternal death of those who hear and believe its message. To think about sin as that from which we need to be rescued is to think back to the very beginning of sin. In the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, it was because of sin that Adam and Eve were told to go away. And a cherubim, a heavenly being with a flaming sword, was stationed at the front of the Garden of Eden so that Adam and Eve could not get back in. Can you think of any more heartbreaking words than for those who had enjoyed perfect, unmediated fellowship with the living God in an Edenic garden to be told, you, you can't be here anymore. You must go away. It, it, it evokes the emotions that, that come with watching the movie Old Yeller, and I'm just going to spoil Old Yeller so that you don't have to watch it. You should never watch that movie. The, the beloved dog gets rabies, and the owner has to shoot the dog. He, he, has, to, he has to tell his dog to go away. He loves the dog. But the dog is now lethal. I mean, it just breaks the heart. Adam and Eve, made in God's image, told, go away, you can't be here anymore. You can't be in God's presence, unmediated anymore in your condition. You're too filthy to be in here. This is the message that Israel, God's chosen nation, received after their multiplied disobediences in the land of blessing. Go away. Go into Assyria, go into Babylon. You will be exiled and then, and then suppressed, oppressed by Gentile nations and then scattered to the ends of the earth. They still have not recovered. Go away. And this is the tragic sentiment in Revelation 20. At the end of time when the wicked dead are judged and they finally are ushered into God's glorious unmediated presence and behold all of his fearful beauty and their names are not found written in the Lamb's book of life but their names and their deeds are found in all those books that record all the deeds the heart motives the secret things the casual words of all the wicked dead from all time they're resurrected to be in God's presence to hear their deeds read to hear their names read and then to hear the words Depart from me, workers of iniquity. Depart from me, I never knew you. And whoever's name was not found written in the Lamb's book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Go 
away. What brings that about? It, it, it's our sin. And you can't generalize this to uh, humanity. We're just not as good as we were supposed to be. But me, you have to personalize this, individualize this. It is my sin that separates me from God. It is my iniquities that put blood on my hands. We must be saved from sin. Number two, we must be saved from this present evil age. There is individual total depravity. And then there is collectivized total depravity. What does it mean to be a sinner and live amongst sinners and live in a world of sinners? It means we need to be rescued. We need to be saved from the world of people among whom we live. Our God and Father uh, and the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus is the one, Galatians 1, 4, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of God our Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. We need to be rescued from this world, this present evil age. And I believe we are really comfortable here, far more comfortable than we ought to be. We grow accustomed to sinful things and sinful people and sinful ways of doing things. And it's only natural because the sin comes from within us. We recognize it in others. We don't really know what it's like to be perfectly holy and sinless. We live here. This has been our only place of residence. And we need to be extricated from it. We need to be pulled out of it. And for now, until that day, we are in it, but not of it, as Jesus said. 1 John 5, 19 describes this world and our need of being saved from it. By the way, all these uh, scripture references are on the notes on the um, Equipping Our Resources page on the website, so you can look at those electronically or Print them for yourselves later. 1 John 5, 19. We know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. That is the present state of things in this world. Philippians 2, 15 calls ours a crooked and perverse generation. This is what we need to be rescued from. We need to be saved from our sin. We need to be saved from this present evil age. And thirdly, we need to be saved from Satan. We need to be saved from Satan. Satan is real. He is an enemy. He is a liar from the beginning, a murderer from the beginning. And yet he parades as an angel of light. I believe we do a grave disservice when we ignore the Bible's testimony about Satan as a real being who is called the God of this world, who operates actively in this world and infiltrates actively in the church. One future equipping hour, we will look at Satan and demons and try to garner a biblical appreciation of who they are, what they do, what they're like, what they're capable of, what they can't do, how they work, and how to be wary. 2 Timothy 2.26 says this, we are to be gentle and correcting those who are in opposition to us if perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth so that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil having been held captive by him to do his will. Satan is active. He takes people captive to do his will. Hebrews 2.14 says this, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, Jesus himself likewise also took part of the same, that through death, through his own death, he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. Satan is active and wields the power of death, not in an ultimate sense, but in a mediatorial sense. James chapter 4 describes the enemy this way. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Uh, 
Satan is an active enemy taking aim at Christians. There is a remedy for that. 1 Peter 5.8 calls Satan a roaring lion roaming the earth, seeking whom he may devour. 1 John 3.8 says that the one who practices sin, that is an ongoing, unbroken habit, lifestyle of sin, is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. And the Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. That we need to be saved from him. And then 1 John 5, 5. Who is the one who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4 tells us that the God of this world, Satan, blinds the minds of unbelievers so that they will not hear the gospel. When somebody gets saved, they are saved not only from their personal sin against God, but they are saved from the captivity and the blindness caused by Satan himself. We need to be rescued from Satan. I want to go back to Paul's address of King Agrippa in Acts 26. And notice how Paul presents all three of these factors, sin, this present evil age, and Satan, as he's speaking to Agrippa that people need to be rescued from. Paul is sent to the Gentiles to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among all those who have been sanctified by faith in me. So darkness to light, from Satan to God, and from sin to forgiveness. Three aspects of our salvation. Fourthly, we need to be saved from self. We need to be saved from ourselves. I want you to turn to Luke 11. And we'll look at Luke 11:13. And this is a classic text on what we might call humanity's relative goodness. Humanity's relative goodness. Total depravity does not mean that sinners are as bad as they possibly could be. No individual sinner has done every conceivable sin or every sin that he or she is personally capable of. What we mean by total depravity is that sin has affected and infected every aspect of the human constitution. It's not just what you do by your behavior. It comes from who you are in your nature, and it affects your words, your thoughts, your deeds, your motives, and your outward actions. Total depravity just means that the entirety of the human spectrum is affected by sin. And universal total depravity means that's true of every human being. But not every human being, and not any individual human being, has been as bad as he possibly could be. And we would ascribe that truth to God's common grace, to God's holding back, holding us back from our potential. Right? You, you, you've heard the, the motivational idea of be all that you can be. No, don't. <laughs> don't be all that you can be. All that you could be would be horrible. And God is kind to keep humanity uh, by um, societal restraint, um, by the active work of his Holy Spirit to restrain. He is called the restrainer um, to, to keep us from being everything that we could be. When you get to 11, Luke eleven thirteen, 13, Jesus is recognizing that sinners do things that are all by themselves better than other things. Now suppose one of you fathers is asked by a son for a fish. He will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he asks for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? This is what we might ascribe as relative goodness. That is, sinful human beings do things better than they otherwise could. Now this is not some sort of absolute goodness that stands on its own merit before a holy God. right? If not done for the glory of God... A father giving his son an egg rather than a scorpion does not outdo his other crimes before God. It does not tip the scales in his favor before God. 
And if not done for the glory of God, it is itself an idolatrous good, even if it reflects a relative goodness that God allows on the earth for the preservation of society. But notice what Jesus says next. The father who gives his son a good gift when asked, verse 13, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, you, being evil, know how to good give gifts. So when you see somebody helping a little old lady across the street, your thought should not be, oh, man's basically good. See how great humanity is? There's hope for us. No, quite the contrary. Jesus would say, huh, see that guy helping the little old lady across the street? That guy is evil. And if that guy can help the little old lady across the street when she asks, how much more your heavenly father give you good gifts out of his infinite goodness? It's an argument from the lesser to the greater, from the worstest to the bestest. It's not a defense of human goodness. Quite the contrary. Jesus affirms evil. It just means that we're not as evil in all of our activities as we could be. But fundamentally, we being evil need to be saved from ourselves. There is nothing in us naturally in our constitution that could bring about a change in God's holy disposition towards sinners. There's nothing in us that can fix the sin problem, the present evil age problem, or the Satan problem. There's nothing in us that could commend us to God's obligations. We actually need to be rescued from us, saved from ourselves. We don't need to be saved from a low view of ourselves, as Robert Schuller said. You know, Robert Schuller's so-called gospel was people need to be saved from thinking about themselves as sinners. He actually said in his book, Self-Esteem, the New Reformation, if you believe that you are a sinner, I believe there is no hope of salvation for you. For Robert Schuller, the good news was high self-esteem. That's terrible news. We don't need to be rescued from a low view of ourselves. We need to be rescued from a high view of ourselves. We need to be rescued from our self-absorption, our self-assessments. We don't need to add Jesus to the, the um, audience of people that I've surrounded myself with that just adore me. I like myself a lot. How do I get Jesus to like me too? That is not the Christian message. Actually, the gospel is opposed to the world's views of self. The, the world's solutions are self-actualization, self-empowerment, self-improvement. Uh, those things aren't even possible. Uh, we need something totally opposed to self. We need to see ourselves as the enemy. Romans chapter 1 addresses humanity in a downward spiral of depravity. The end of Romans chapter 1 is just this litany of things God has given sinful humanity over to. And this list is remarkable. Verse 28. They did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, and God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. Being filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity, they are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And all they know, although they know the ordinances of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only continue to do these very things, but encourage those who practice them. Misery loves company. Depravity loves company. Nobody wants the apple cart upset. It's why you, Christian, when you walk into a, a situation where everybody's telling the same dirty jokes or everybody's compromising in the, the same ethical compromises at work and you do something different or everybody's lazy in the office and you're the one with a biblical work ethic and then you get run out of the office. You have to find a new job. Because those things which reflect the character of God become stark contrast and uncomfortable to those who want approval for practicing those things that God hates. And then chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment, 
So if in your sinful humanity you thought, well, I don't do all those dirty deeds, well, you have no excuse you who pass judgment because you do the same things. The externals might be different. The internals are all the same. It's interesting uh, talking uh, to a friend whose job was to oversee uh, people who were incarcerated and has just changed jobs to oversee those who are sitting in a Christian school classroom. <laughs> Isn't that a great change of environment? Man, the people must be so different. You know what Bobby Casillas said? Oh, they're the same. <laughs> the human heart's the same. But we need to be rescued from ourselves. Matthew 15, 19, Jesus made this very clear. Where does all the sin come from? Um, can, can I blame Satan for the sin that comes out of my heart? No, we, we can indict Satan for being the God of this world, for being a tempter, a liar, an enslaver, a blinder. Can we blame my little sister for my crimes? Can I blame my situation, my circumstance? I couldn't help it. This is just what happened to me. Notice what Jesus says. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. They defile the man. The sin doesn't come from outside of us. Sin comes from inside of us. Humanity, in order to be saved, must come to the fundamental realization that I am the problem. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. This is what Paul the, the Apostle came to realize. Philippians 3, we have the remarkable testimony of a very moral and religious man who had the right upbringing in the right place, had the right teachers, did the right things, and in the audience of men was blameless. And then he met Christ. Listen to Paul's testimony. Verse 4 of Philippians 3, I myself might have confidence in the flesh, but if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, persecutor of the church, as to righteousness which is in the law found blameless, not before God, but before men. Verse 7, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ, and that I may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death in order that I might attain the resurrection of the dead. Paul knew he had to lose himself to have Christ. And everything that he'd made of himself, which was in the world's eyes about as good as it could get, was rubbish. To be saved means to run away from you, Everything that you are naturally, everything that you've made yourself to be in order to run to Christ. It means to be rescued, not just from sin, not just from the present evil age, not just from Satan, but from you. Number five, we are to be saved from the consequences of sin. Not just sin in its nature, uh, not merely sin in the deeds, but also the consequences of sin. Listen again to Isaiah 59. Your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. One of the consequences of being separated from God is a barrier between us and God. There is enmity between us and God. So that being in a, an unbroken life of sin 
means God's not listening. God's not hearing prayer. There, there's blood on your hands and, and that has separated you from God. Verse three, your hands are defiled with blood, your fingers with iniquity, your lips have spoken falsehood, your tongue mutters wickedness. Down in verse nine, therefore, justice is far away and righteousness does not overtake us. We hope for light, but behold, darkness, for brightness, but we walk in gloom. We grope along the wall like blind men. We grope like those who have no eyes. We stumble at midday as in the twilight. Among those who are vigorous, we are like dead men. All of us growl like bears and moan sadly like doves. We hope for justice, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before you, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and we know our iniquities, transgressing and denying the Lord, turning away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving in and uttering from the heart lying words, justice is turned back. All of these things are consequences of sin. One of the most grievous consequences of sin is further sin. Sin begets sin. Sin multiplies like rabbits. John 8, 34, Jesus said, anyone who sins is a slave of sin. And of course, the ultimate consequence of sin, the justice of God, eternal judgment, is what sinners must be rescued from. There are also temporal consequences of sin, and there are no guarantees that we will be rescued from any given temporal consequence. Although it is something I think we can long for and pray for, especially the consequence of being given over to further sin. <laughs> Lord, keep me from iniquity. But you think about the temporal consequences of sin, some of those we might just call natural consequences, right? You spend money you don't have on your credit card, the consequence is you're going to be paying interest and you'll be in debt for a long time. That is a natural consequence. And you can grieve over the sin of being irresponsible and ask for God to miraculously remove the debt, and he just may not do that. <laughs> he might remove the debt by other means, a household budget, hard work, etc. That would be a natural consequence to sin. We might long for them to be removed, and they may not be removed. Physical disease is another good example of a consequence of sin. Enslavement is a consequence of sin, and, and there's a categorical enslavement of sin that is true of every unbeliever. The one who sins categorically is a slave of sin. Romans 6 illustrates the fact that when you become a Christian, you are flee freed from the categorical tyranny of the slavery and bondage of sin. You have a new slave master, Jesus Christ, with new results, holiness of life. But there is a, a sort of enslavement. It's probably not exactly the right word. We might just think of the word habit and pattern. When you sin, you dig a channel for sin through which it's easier to go the next time around. You think about the wagon trains that went across the Midwest, the Oregon Trail, and they dug deep ruts in the mud that are still visible in places to this day. And it's hard to get out of those ruts when you've driven them. The, the idea of habit and habit forming is actually a gift from the Lord. If you had to learn to retie your shoes or shave your face, if you're a guy, every time you woke up in the morning, you had to relearn those fundamental uh, tasks. It would take you so long. You may not get out the door in the morning or you'd get out with cuts all over your face and, and your shoes in knots that can't be undone. No, but we, we do things by repetition and we learn them and then we can do them almost automatically without thinking and you can multitask and do lots of things while you're tying your shoes. Well, habit works negatively the other way. When you sin, you create a rut, you form a habit that then becomes hard to break. That is a consequence of sin. There is a darker consequence of sin, which is judicial hardening. And we see this over and over again in Scripture where, uh, like in Romans 1, God gave them over, God gave them over, God gave them over. If you want sin, God may give you over to sin and further sin. 
And one of the worst things you can get in life is exactly what you're asking for. If what you're asking for is disloyalty to Christ. Uh, this was the reason for the exile for Israel. Under every green tree and on every high hill, they worshiped all the gods of the nations. It's as if the nations of the world could not invent gods fast enough for Israel to play the harlot with. And God eventually said, you want the gods of Assyria? I'll give you the gods of Assyria. You want the gods of Babylon? I'll give you the gods of Babylon. And you will go and you will serve them in their land. There are, of course, civil consequences at times to sin in the temporal courts of human justice. And we may or may not be released from those temporary consequences. To be saved does mean ultimately to be rescued from that ultimate consequence. And at times there are temporal remedies to the consequences of sin that God invites us to enter into. In Genesis chapter 4, speaking to Cain, God says in verse 6, Yahweh said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you and you must master it. What comes with sin? A guilty conscience, shame, confusion, a downward countenance. Psalm 32, the psalmist relates the physiological component of having hidden sin unconfessed. And these things can be relieved by repentance and the grace of God. To ask for the stay of temporal consequences. I believe the Lord invites us to that. And there's no guarantee that an individual con uh, consequence of sin may be taken away. But we must be rescued from the ultimate consequence of our sin. That is the unfolding of God's infinite justice against us. Number six. We need to be saved also from death. We need to be saved from death. Hebrews 2.15 describes that those who are in Jesus are freed from the fear of death and subject to its slavery. 1 Corinthians 15 calls death that last enemy. Death itself is an enemy, and death itself will die. Death itself personified in Revelation chapter 20 is thrown into the lake of fire, never to be heard from again. In the new heavens and new earth, beginning in Revelation 21, uh, chapter 21, verse 4, there is no more death. We need to be saved from death. It's true that as a Christian, when you become born again, you have entered into eternal life. There is still the physical demise that we face, but even death for the believer has been transformed. Now, that's a topic for another time. Revelation chapter 20, verse 6, describes the second death, and those who have been born again do not face a second death, but those who have not been born again will face the second death. It's been said uh, cleverly, born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. Matthew 5, 22. Jesus says, I say to you that everyone who is guilty before his brother shall be guilty before the court. Whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. That second death, hell, or the lake of fire, is unending conscious torment under the right, holy, beautiful, good wrath of God against sin. God's justice is unflinching, and so eternal punishment will never end, will never yield. There will be no amelioration of its pain. There will be no mercy. That is the second death. The sinners need to be rescued from death. Number seven on the list. 
We need to be saved from sin. We are to be saved from this present evil age, saved from Satan, saved from ourselves, saved from the consequences of sin, saved from death, which itself is a consequence of sin. And then number seven, Christians, we are to be saved from our present unglorified condition. The Bible speaks of salvation as something for the Christian that is past, present, and future. There are texts that speak of our salvation as having been done once for all in the past. You have been saved. There are other texts that talk about Christians being saved. There is a progressive reality that a salvation unfolds for Christians. Nobody who got saved is outside of the category of being saved. There is a progressive reality to that. And then there is a future reality that the Bible speaks about as well. We'll look at one of those texts here, Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21 that relates our salvation to a final yet future event. So a Christian in good conscience with his Bible, Bible open can say, I haven't been saved yet in the future final sense. A Christian can also say, I am being saved now, not in a Roman Catholic sense of trying to muster up enough merit over time to get in finally and you don't know if you're ever in or not but in the ongoing progressive sense of the security of what God does in the life of a believer. And a Christian can also say, yes, I have already been saved once and for all. But listen to this future element, Philippians 3, for our citizenship is in heaven, verse 20, from which we also eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. That is a future reality. That is a salvation that we long for, that we still look forward to. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50, I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does the perishable inherit the imperishable. And then in verse 13, the perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. We're not there yet. We haven't experienced that final element of salvation. We actually need to be rescued from our present unglorified state in order to be qualified to experience the eternal state in glorified bodies. And then finally, number eight this morning, we need to be saved from all of these things, from sin, from this present evil age, from Satan, from ourselves, from the consequences of our sin, from death, from our present unglorified condition. But truly, ultimately, we need to be saved from God. We need to be saved from God. Well, let's look together at a few texts. Romans chapter 5. Verse 9. Having now been justified by Jesus' blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. That captures the reality that God is the one from whom we must be rescued. The book of Romans opens with a proclamation of the good news, Romans 1.16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Why do we need salvation? Verse 17 of Romans 1, because the wrath of God is being revealed against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. We must be saved from God. 1 Corinthians 3.15, similarly, it says, if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved. <laughs> saved from what? Saved from the scrutinizing fire of God's judgment. Look, it's not Satan that stands at the final judgment, arbitrating who gets in and who gets out. It certainly is not humans. Uh, it is God himself who is the judge. 1 Corinthians 5.5, 5, Paul says, I've decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. That future salvation is a salvation from God. Listen to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 
and verse 9. For God has not destined us believers for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, whose wrath is in view in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, God's. And so the salvation in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 is a salvation from God's wrath. I grew up reading Gary Larson's Far Side cartoons. Do you remember those? Satan was always depicted there as the ruler of hell. You know, he's got his pitchfork and his horns, you know, and there's the guy with the wheelbarrow who's like carrying a load and he's whistling. And, and uh, Satan says, man, we just don't seem to be getting through to that guy. And, and the idea in all of Gary Larson's cartoons is that hell is Satan's realm, right? This is sort of the popular notion in our world. I, I don't want to go to heaven and be with all the goody two-shoes. I want to go to hell with Satan and party with my friends. Well, it's not Satan's realm. Satan is, in fact, hell's first victim. Jesus said that the lake of fire was prepared for the devil and his angels, not to rule, but to be tormented day and night forever and ever. That is the place where God rules. In fact, in Revel the book of Revelation, people, said that, people are said to endure that lake of fire where their torment goes on forever and ever in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. We need to be rescued from God, the judge. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 says that Christians are those who have turned to God from idols and they wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. There is a coming wrath. It is God's wrath from which we need to be rescued. Two more verses, Romans chapter 2. I'll leave that one behind. Let's go to Luke chapter 12 and verse 49. I think in popular Christian culture, Jesus has the reputation of being the sweet, gentle Jesus who didn't judge anybody. You know, that, that um, the reputation of hellfire and brimstone belongs properly to Jonathan Edwards, you know, that colonial era preacher in New England, sinners in the hands of an angry God. If you read much Jonathan Edwards, you know that his sermons on heaven and the love of God and the grace of God far outweigh his content on hellfire and brimstone. And if you've read the Gospels, you know that Jesus' teaching on hell far outweigh his teachings on heaven. Here's one remarkable interlude from Jesus. He says in Luke 12, 49, I have come to cast fire upon the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. Whoa. I thought Jesus came down to love everybody. Well, yes, he, as the son of man, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came down to lay down his life as a ransom for many. He, he came to love sinners. But this impulse is also in our Lord. I have come to cast fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. Jesus, as God in the flesh, as holy, feels all the impulse that his father feels about sin. He hates sin. He's never sinned. And he must punish sin. And in John 5, Jesus says, the father has given all judgment into the hands of the son. It is Jesus who sits on the throne of final judgment. It is Jesus whose wrath exists in the lake of fire for all of eternity. And notice what Jesus says in the next verse. After he says, how I wish it were already kindled. <laughs> I mean, you can just feel this. I'm around sinners all the time. Oh, judgment must come. Verse 50, but, and this but saves sinners. Jesus says, I have a baptism to undergo. And how distressed of soul am I until it is accomplished? What does he mean by baptism, by immersion? He means his immersion under the full-fledged, unflinching, infinite wrath of his Father against sin. Not against his sins, but against the sins of everyone who would ever believe. He would go to the cross and be a sin-bearer to bear all of that wrath, all of that justice, all of that consequence for everyone who trusts in Jesus for salvation. Salvation from sin, 
Salvation from the present evil age, salvation from Satan, salvation from self, salvation from all of the consequences, salvation from death, salvation from broken bodies in our present condition, and ultimately salvation from God himself. Jesus went to the cross to secure salvation in total for everyone who would cry out, Lord, have mercy on me, the sinner. What do we need to be saved from? Many things. But this brings us to the theocentric solution, that is the God-centered solution. Who could possibly save us from sin? None but God. Who could possibly release us from captivity in this present evil age? None but God, who's outside of it. Who could possibly rescue us from Satan, the God of this world who blinds the minds of unbelievers? None but the one who said, let light shine out of darkness, who shines the gospel into our hearts. Who could save us from ourselves? Who could save us from the consequences of sin? Who could save us ultimately from God? Only God. When we speak of our salvation, it is right for us to say that God saves us from himself. We must be saved from God, and we can only be saved by God. And as we'll speak later, we are to be saved unto God. And when we think about Romans 11, in terms of our salvation and the manifold mercies of God, we must cry out with Paul. Salvation is from him and through him and to him. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this doctrine of salvation. No one text of Scripture could capture all that it is. No one lecture could look at all the facets in this beautiful diamond and see all of its brilliance. No, we must spend an eternity turning salvation over in our hands, examining it. But better yet, we get to experience your love your grace to us personally through your great salvation. God, I pray that if there are any here this morning hearing these words, that you would bring to their heart a full conviction over their own sin and culpability, that they would come to the full realization that they are the problem, that they are in fact bound and bundled by manifold barriers to heaven that can only be undone, only be removed, only be shattered by your grace. Oh God, may they experience your grace. And would you equip each one of us to go out from this room, eager to share your grace, your love, your salvation with all who would hear. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.